So um, my name is George Sabanko. I'm a professor here. Uh, Brian Pogue normally does this. He's traveling today, so I have the honor of introducing our speaker. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, the first year graduate students who are here for the first time. The Jones Seminar is an important part of uh, your educational experience. And uh, uh, I'm sure today's uh, presentation will be enriching in various ways. So it's, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, Doug Midori. I've got uh, uh, a, a, a web page up here that describes Doug. This is from the Washington Post. You know, most academics are happy when they get quoted in the, the mainstream media, like a, a, the New York Times or Washington Post, Post quotes them. But, uh, you know, Doug, they actually wrote a story about Doug. So, uh, so he was called the man who could see the Internet. So uh, Doug is from uh, Hyde Park, New York, uh, went to University of Virginia as an undergraduate, uh, after which he served five years uh, in the Air Force. So I have a, uh, a story, another story here about the former Air Force officer is one of the U.S. most renowned experts on the structure of the Internet. And here's a picture of Doug in Iraq in 2003. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, after uh, serving, uh, being deployed in Iraq, uh, he left the Air Force and came to Thayer School where he did a master's degree with me. Um, I don't think any of the work he did on his master's degree has any relevance to what you're doing today. Is that right? Or? It's wireless internet. Okay, so there's some connection. Um, after his master's degree here, uh, he worked uh, at BAE Systems in New Hampshire, uh, was a, a security manager at DHMC, and then joined Renesis, which was acquired by Dine Research, where uh, he works now. So uh, with that introduction, let's welcome Doug. Um, Yeah, if you've got a question, can everybody hear me all right? Um, that would be that would be fine. I, uh, I don't have a power cord. Maybe maybe we'll we'll last. We'll see. If everything goes dark, we'll know what happened. Um, I know it's star star star. That's all right. Okay, great. All right, so as George said, thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Doug Midori, I'm the Director of Internet Analysis uh, here at, at, at Dyne. Uh, Dyne Research is the part of Dyne that, we, uh, that I'm a part of. And so uh, we do a lot, of, uh, we have a lot of blog stories and media stories about uh, happenings on the Internet. I'm going to try to highlight some of the, um, uh, give you some of the highlights of those in the, uh, that have occurred in the last uh, couple of years. And uh, they kind of fall into two buckets. I'm going to try to do run through both uh, in this talk uh, as uh, as f fast and effectively as I as I can because there's uh, a lot of good stories there. And I feel like, uh, oops, it's got a lot mind of, mind of its own. Um, uh, and uh, I want to um, uh, kind of cover see what I can, see if I can cover them all. All right, but um, the. Uh, you know, I, as George mentioned, I, I came from the military. I was uh, um, uh, actually scheduled to go uh, be part of the invasion into Iraq in March or February. It was originally going to be in February 2003. Uh, and um, uh, I decided at that moment, I was like, I think I want to go to civilian grad school uh, after, after my time. And uh, I was stationed in Italy at the time. And I uh, reached out to a few different professors. In the end, it was George that uh, I, I got in touch with. And... Um, uh, and we made my made my way here to to Dartmouth and was here ten years ago, sitting in chairs, the same room, doing Jones Media Jones uh, Jones Media Jones seminars, and um, uh, and based off my experience with Jones Jones seminars, I I, uh, I know some of them can be very informative and maybe a little technical and dry. I'm going to try to tell them more of the war stories because I feel like those are the ones that are uh, uh, not war. 
war, but war stories uh, that are more, um, uh, uh, yeah, there's no, there's no actual war stories here. Um, those are what hold currency and are cap capture the imagination and help tell the story of what it is that we do. So, so there's the two buckets. There's the routing uh, security issues, um, and then there's also the geopolitical things that we, uh, these days, uh, a major geopolitical event uh, doesn't occur anymore without some internet component to it. Typically, somebody's shutting off access to something or somebody. And uh, usually we're try, we try to um, inform that discourse with the uh, data that we have and analysis we can do. And we, uh, we are kind of a, one of the go-to outfits to get ask the, the, the media comes to to ask questions about something that's happening in some part of the world that's uh, experiencing some um, uh, you know, political strife. So all right, so to understand uh, the Internet and what it is that we're doing uh, and, and some of the examples I go through in this story, there's a, a, I have to kind of lay a little bit of groundwork of what is, how is the Internet organized. I think there's um, a common misconception for people, even technical people who uh, uh, don't uh, do the kind of work that, uh, uh, that I do, it, that uh, the Internet is this amorphous thing that everybody kind of connects uh, this is good. Um, connects to, uh, you can connect to anybody, everybody's connected to each other, everybody's a little bit of a kumbaya kind of thing, everybody just uh, makes it happen and somehow it just works. In reality, there's actually a, a structure to the internet, there's a hierarchy, there's a business, and there are people not do it, that are doing things only because they're paid to do it. And, uh, and that actually uh, creates structure and or, or, uh, organizes, uh, is an organizing principle to the internet. It's a good thing that people are... Uh, that this is the case that uh, people make money at it, and also it's the secret to the success of the of uh, the internet, the industry around the internet. <clears throat> so there is a notional uh, layout where you've got a hierarchy. You have got uh, uh, access networks at the bottom, customer networks uh, buying service from um, uh, you know maybe middle level, uh, layer tier uh, ISPs that buy uh, access from top tier uh, networks, and uh, and then they stay. Your your traffic may travel along a, a hump as it goes up this, this uh, from one place to another, from your uh, network to some Stanford in California or something, you're going to go through the internet and perhaps uh, traverse this, uh, this hierarchical structure uh, where um, uh, people are basically paying for service for the, from the, the people uh, above them uh, and then people being ISPs uh, and then eventually you reach the top tier of the internet and there's a kind of a cabal of a uh, handful of ISPs that don't buy from anybody. They exchange traffic from, for free with each other and uh, yeah, that's kind of the layout of the internet. So there's this hierarchical uh, cone uh, style way to think about it. Um, so that's the layout, but on any part of the internet you've got uh, layers to it uh, and it, typically the terminology we use are either the physical plane this is actually the, the fiber, actual fiber optic cables, whether it's a transoceanic cable or a copper cable, Cat5 uh, wireless medium, some, some physical connection uh, that you're connecting. Uh, there are, um, there's a data plane where actually the, the traffic that you're, you're surfing on the internet tra traverses the internet uh, in this data plane. And then there's a control plane that's a kind of meta plane above it <coughs> that's organizing how traffic moves across the internet. And that control plane is governed by border gateway protocol. It's kind of a neat thing, this border gateway protocol, because it is uh, the entire global internet is uh, governed by a single instance of BGP version four. It will be, has been, always been, and will always be this one instance running. Um, and uh, if you know anything about routing protocols, like the network of uh, Dartmouth, it probably has like OSPF or something. If you're familiar with routing protocols, probably to keep all the routers in sync as far as how they how traffic gets routed around the campus. Well, imagine one instance for the whole world uh, that everybody uh, participates in, and that's uh, that's how. Uh, uh, and what's happening there is uh, routes of how to reach different uh, IP addresses are exchanged between ISPs, and that is uh, the data that is um, transferred in, in the BGP protocol. So, in BGP, there's uh, there's a handful of terms to know, but it, we'll just boil it down to the two key ones are prefixes and ASNs, and I probably will mention those terms later in the uh, uh, in the talk. But uh, if you can just remember, uh, prefix is basically a uh, a range of contiguous IP addresses that's uh, say a block of addresses, and these are routed together, uh, um, uh, or yeah, they are all routed in a similar fashion, and there's a, a 
Often we also also call these like a route or a network, but um, but in the in the BGB parlance, it's a prefix, and it refers to in an IP address. There's there's a prefix and a suffix, and the prefix is the portion uh, that's the network portion of the address, and then there's a host portion that identifies the unique uh, machine that is uh, using that address. And so the prefix is often written as a in a slash notation where you have uh, uh, some do, a dotted decimal for v4 is dotted decimal. Um, uh, and then a slash 24, and that refers to the first 24 bits of this 32-bit address is the network portion, and that is uh, uh, going to be a route that gets circulated in, in BGP or any routing protocol. Another unique thing of BGP is uh, ASN. So at these are autonomous system numbers, and so in again, in BGP parlance, uh, an entity out there that participates in routing traffic is an autonomous system. So Dartmouth is an autonomous system. Uh, these are, uh, and it's just basically, an, and it's assigned an integer uh, that, ref that is how it's uniquely identified. And so an ASN is an integer, and these are example ASNs here. So you have Verizon, uh, AS701, Sprints1239. If you were like me and you work with this data all day, every day for years on end, you end up memorizing hundreds, if not thousands, of, the, of these numbers. Uh, I can name, name providers in any country almost in the world and uh, of what know them by their numbers. Um, and, uh, but it's important to, to appreciate that these are abstractions. So these numbers are abstractions. Like 701 is one integer that represents Verizon. Verizon is a huge network with thousands of people, thousands of offices, thousands of you know, co networking components reduced down to one network, uh, to one integer. And if you were to draw uh, that level of abstraction of the internet, you still can't draw it. Like it's not, I mean, people do it and they do it kind of for artistic purposes, but uh, not in a way that you could meaningfully understand, in my opinion. Um, but uh, so there is, uh, that's just uh, maybe, uh, uh, insight into the vastness of the global internet. So these are autonomous system numbers, ASs, I think we'll see those. So this is an example of Dartmouth. So we're here, here, if you are on the wireless or the campus network here, you would be, this is how your uh, address, uh, address space uh, for how outsiders send traffic to IP addresses that you were assigned here, how it kind of uh, comes, uh, at least the last couple of ASN hops to, uh, to Dartmouth College. So Dartmouth College has AS 10755, uh, and, uh, and then it announces its address spaces to a handful of uh, 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 entities. Uh, it's not denoted in this diagram, but I can tell just from knowing, uh, like National Lambda Rail is an academic network. They are probably have a peering relationship with them, whereas uh, VTEL, Level 3, and Comcast are transit providers. That means Dartmouth pays them money for the bandwidth that they get from, uh, from those service providers, whereas Lynn Harvard uh, would be one, probably another academic network that's just sharing uh, uh, without likely without the exchange of, of money. So that is uh, kind of a ball and stick layout. But again, level three, level three is the largest global telecom in the world, reduced down to a single integer. Uh, actually, coincidentally, um, uh, founded by uh, Peter Kewitt, uh, uh, Dartmouth alum, but you know, from his brick making, uh, brick making career led to the largest telecom in the world, uh, the Dartmouth connection. So in summary, so BGP, this is, governs how traffic uh, is, is uh, sent across the internet. I've kind of just, just touched on a, a couple of concepts here. This is, I mean, it could be a, a much deeper, deeper talk, but just to get onto the examples. Um, in, in a nutshell, you have 50,000 entities that are autonomous systems that are exchanging traffic. Uh, typically, their relationships are governed, or business relationships, where they are one side sending money to uh, the other side for access to, uh, to bandwidth. Um, and then the, the number of routes that make up the global routing table is something like 550,000. I don't know what it is today, but it's on that order, which is actually kind of remarkable that the global internet can be reduced down to 500, 550,000 lines of how do you reach everything. Um, each AS will advertise its uh, address space to its adjacent, um, uh, uh, adjacent ASs, and that's how they learn, and then those routes keep propagating out, and they propagate across the internet, and then that's how everybody knows how to reach address space at Dartmouth as those routes uh, propagate. Uh, this is a slide from a talk in the Netherlands, so I gave a couple of Dutch examples here. Uh, the algorithm, each, each autonomous system is, is selecting the routes, choosing which, which route it would use to reach every IP address. Yes, question? This is sort of pertaining to what you're talking about. Okay. How about errors in the system? Do any messages truly get lost? Or how is that dealt with? Uh, let's see. Because you're, you're dealing with all... Yeah, there's... So there's... 
Uh, we'll talk about errors in routing. Uh, there, are, I mean, as far as like packets getting dropped or something that are uh, messages getting dropped, um, I think it's a fairly dependable uh, connection as far as uh, like a, a BGP session between your routers. But in the in the context of routing itself, I'm going to give you some examples of, of things that have gone wrong, um, and and they go wrong every day. Uh, any any given day, you can find mistakes. I think it's just a, 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 a by virtue of the fact that you have thousands of routers typing into uh, thousands of humans typing into routers around the world, mistakes are going to be made. There's a, you can't uh, remove the human element there. Um, and then the, the problem is that um, like, like everything at the beginning of the internet, uh, it had no security baked in, and that was both its success and now uh, uh, something that we now have to deal with. Uh, that. Any AS can kind of do anything. Dartmouth College could start announcing address space of Google today. They could uh, now Google would probably figure it out fairly quickly. They would have to try to either contact somebody here and have them give them a stop. If that didn't work, then they try to go with somebody upstream and try to get them to shut off uh, Dartmouth. But that is a human process uh, that takes time, and you have to have good contacts. You have somebody who's answering the phone who will. Uh, so that's that's how it's solved right now, and that's probably has to be solved for a long time. Uh, and there are technical ways people are trying to uh, solve this problem, but. Uh, I think for the for the time being, we're going to be that's the state we'll be in. So in summary, we have the system that directs traffic uh, for, uh, from any any point A to any point B on the internet, and uh, it's in, based entirely by, uh, uh, on trust, trusting that everybody's going to do everything uh, correctly. And we've we've uh, I'll give you a couple examples of where we've seen that trust violated. So in 2013, we saw the first in the wild. Uh, instance of a BGP man in the middle attack. Now, this had long been uh, theorized. People knew that this was a, a possibility. There was a black hat talk uh, that one could do this, and uh, this was uh, and so it was well known uh, in theory. And then we've uh, this was the first instance where we caught this in the wild, where uh, this entity out of Belarus was announcing address space uh, of. They targeted a number of different entities. There were U.S. Finance, financial institutions targeted. That we now work with, um, and there are also a lot of foreign governments uh, targeted. There was uh, they had a thing for foreign ministry, ministries of foreign affairs um, of various governments that uh, they were targeting. So it wasn't clear. Some days it looked like it was criminal. Some days it looked like it was state sponsored. Maybe it was both. I, I'm not really sure. Uh, I, I all we knew is we could see the routing occurring and seeing uh, what we see was uh, trap. Like there was these these graphs, these diagrams, uh, maps that we uh, posted to explain this are based off of trace route data that we, we send out. So we uh, perform about 500 million trace routes a day. I think the number is, uh, maybe it's more. We have about 250 locations around the world where we're basically trace routing the entire internet every day, and we're just tracking how, how does traffic uh, flow. We have the, the routing data tells us how it should potentially go, and then we put our own traffic, and that gives us a little more flavor. We can kind of measure how long it took to get from one place to another. BGP doesn't answer that uh, for you, and then also what cities you're traversing, precisely uh, a more more detail. But the only way to get at that, VGP is never going to answer that thing. You have to send your own traffic and measure. Uh, and so trace routes basically just plot out what are all the routers between where I am and this other part of the internet. So we do that uh, to the entire internet every day. And so when there's incidents like this, we see our trace routes get sucked into it, and then we can see what uh, get a good idea of what's actually happening here. And so we were seeing trace routes getting sucked into Belarus, uh, domestic traffic out of the United States, reroute, rerouted uh, out to Europe, into the Belarus, and then on to its destination. So someone who is affected by this might uh, notice that their website seems a little sluggish that day, but it may not be perceptible, uh, the difference in performance, uh, that t for them to know that this is going through Eastern Europe now uh, while I'm uh, in uh, on my session with my banking web page or some, something like that. Yes, question? What does MIT stand for? Oh, man in the middle. Man in the middle, yeah. So there's a man in the middle can refer to, there's a lot of different types of attacks, a different uh, man in the middle kind of things. In this case, it just refers to there's somebody in the, in the path that shouldn't normally be in the path, and uh, just very generally. And, uh, and so I don't have, oops, yeah, I don't have, uh, we're not really a security research operation, we're a routing uh, analysis, and, uh, and so um, uh, I don't know the, the rest of the story from the security standpoint. I know from a routing standpoint, this is for sure uh, suspicious activity. And so this is an example, again, I, we were talking to uh, folks in the, uh, in the Netherlands a couple months ago and gave them a, a European example. This was uh, from, from uh, Finland to the foreign, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Lithuania, and this was a, an example of a trace route showing that was getting redirected into Minsk and then on to its uh, final destination you know, through Moscow, so 
perhaps they're implicated as well. And then for the, uh, these, these uh, routes here on the, um, uh, on the right, these are autonomous system numbers that refer to um, what's the legitimate route. Typically, we have AS paths. These are the paths of the autonomous systems that your traffic goes through. And it basically appears as a series of integers. And so we see the normal path, and then we see a new one show up that's, got a, uh, that's not, um, not normal. And then combine that with the trace routes, we can see that the, uh, um, uh, the data uh, goes on uh, through others. Yes? Yes. How exactly was it carried out? Yeah, carried out. Well, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's kind of an open question. Uh, so there are exploits on routers that are known. Uh, you do need to have access to a router that, uh, that is speaking BGP. Uh, you know, to pull something off, you also would need to have access to something that could, you know, if, if, the, if the idea is either to intercept, manipulate, or do something, record the traffic, you also need to be in the path of the traffic, so you're going to need to have some access to other networking equipment as well. So, you, so not just everybody could do this. You you need to have hack, compromise some re networking infrastructure, and now you're using it to do something. So that was my question. Okay. I cannot. I couldn't visualize how they could have done it remotely entirely. Yeah. Yeah, you need to ha find a device, but I, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, again, I'm not a security researcher. I'm not sure how hard that is, uh, considering you know there are uh, we later later in this year we we uh, the same year we put out a, a bunch of uh, similar attacks we saw out of uh, Iceland, and we kind of got into a debate with the uh, the ISP there of what we what we're seeing. They ultimately said that it was their um, Cisco management software that uh, was just kicking out errors, and that was just the cause versus the compromise and. And I, I don't have access to their stuff, so I can't just sit remotely and look at data and be like, I don't know, I know it's a, a hacker did this. But having said that, we, there, was a, there was a handful of pieces uh, to this story that seemed like they were um, awfully suspicious, to, and, they were at, and the bug that they quoted uh, didn't seem like it jived with what we were seeing. So um, uh, we'll agree to disagree on that uh, case. But uh, regardless, we agreed on the facts. The hijacks occurred a lot. In that case, in Iceland, you had a lot of it. Mostly it was domestic U.S. traffic routed out of the country through Iceland and, uh, and back to the United States. Um, and uh, they conceded that. Uh, and the question was, how did this come to be? And uh, we actually had a relationship with them uh, as soon as it started, and we let them know that we were seeing this. We do that. We, do our, we are kind of good citizens, uh, and we do let people know. And it's like, hey, well, I don't know what's going on here, but we're seeing this. You're doing this. And uh, I guess in the subsequent investigations, uh, um, when we, we they, they no longer were responding to us after a while, and we were only talking through reporters that were covering the story. But they did find that we did, they did confirm that we had notified them like the day after this started, uh, and they didn't know why. They, they turned it off because it had lasted for a couple of weeks. Um, but anyway, so that's the, that's the, that's the world I live in of uh, you know, kind of half, half explained things that are uh, kind of suspicious. So, does that answer your question? All right. Uh, last year, um, Dell's uh, SecureWorks came out with a, a story about um, BGP hijacks that were, they were that was a, this one was good where they kind of figured out what was the point of the, the hijack. You had an operation out of Montreal uh, announcing a, a address base, and the purpose was to try to, and I'm not a Bitcoin expert here, to, uh, to uh, divert uh, Bitcoin mining operations to generate money, uh, and, uh, and they were able to uh, estimate and uh, generate $80,000 from this uh, operation. These graphs were actually made in discussion with us and Amazon uh, about trying to figure out what was happening here. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't know enough about Bitcoin, to, uh, and I even knew even, we even saw the, the Bitcoin-related uh, sites uh, be, you know, hosted in these things, but I didn't understand Maybe I still don't under, completely understand how uh, <clears throat> how you make money out of that, but um, uh, so good on them for they they get that discovery. Uh, I um, I'll, get, I'll get the next one hopefully. All right, so how are we supposed to interpret those graphs? Oh, sorry, yeah, these these graphs are um, uh, so x-axis is time uh, and the y-axis is uh, these are these are routes that were um, announced by uh, let's see they were. Announced by, uh, let's see, yeah, these were all falsified autonomous system numbers, and these were bogus routes meant to attract traffic from uh, uh, from 
uh, you know, it was Amazon, OVH, and DigitalOcean, all the hosting, hosting operations. And so the, the y-axis is uh, how much of our, our, so we have about 400 and some uh, telecoms around the world that give us live feeds of their data, of their, what they're seeing for their, uh, how they route traffic to the global internet. And, um, uh, and so it helps us to see over time uh, what was the percentage of, or the or accounts of peers, how many peers saw different um, uh, these routes as they were getting propagated. So in this case, it was only like 35 of our 400 and something peers saw this. So it was actually kind of a limited scope. It's the y-axis. I think you kind of do need to be a BGP nut to try to uh, get a lot of value. Other than to know that this staccato thing, they were kind of announcing it. Uh, they were kind of announcing it, turning it off, turning it on, off. I'm not sure how that plays into the, the strategy, but there's a, there was some, I don't know if that was to try to evade detection or what, but it was uh, that was the profile, that it wasn't just on solid. It was, it was kind of Coming on, like toggling on and off, that's the that's maybe something that we can get out of the, the those graphs. But it helps to sh show just what was the extent uh, versus uh, if we saw 400 and some providers, it was it was limited, and um, yeah, for some reason had that had that pattern of kind of on and off. Thanks for the question. All right, so. Uh, we've got more examples, but I have to move on. Uh, but I think the, the takeaway there is that the global routing system uh, can be and has been manipulated to redirect internet traffic. And there's also a class of errors. So we asked about errors, and uh, let's see. So um, I'll try to quickly uh, go through this. So I, I may have mentioned early the, the, the idea of, of peering. <clears throat> so peering is... Uh, um, there's a, it's an overloaded term in BGP. Peering can, uh, sometimes it's referred to just as adjacent uh, peers. In this case, I'm talking about uh, what's for, referred to as settlement-free peering, and this, is, this is refers to the exchange of traffic between two entities uh, for free, uh, where they, two you know, similar-sized ISPs might decide that it's mutually beneficial if they just exchange traffic for free and they establish a peering relationship. And, um, uh, and so then the traffic would just stay from their customers, would exchange across that link and go back to their customers as this uh, diagram is trying to reflect where announcements, to make this work, the announcements need to go out of one customer cone. So if ISP A and ISP B are peering, then uh, the BGP announcements for address space out of uh, A's customer cone would go up through A over to B and down into B's cone. And then the traffic will follow the opposite path of the, of the, uh, um, uh, of the uh, path. Let's see. I'm getting a low battery thing. Does anybody have a Mac uh, um, power? Uh, it's a couple years old. 20, well, actually maybe it's last year's. All right, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so there's a couple ways that this can, this can get messed up and we see this, I think on any given day you can find examples where somebody's messed uh, this part up. Let's see. Ooh. Oh, good. Yeah, well, it's, we'll know when you plug it in. Yes, thank you very much. All right, so there's a couple ways this goes awry, and this is a kind of a, a perhaps a pedestrian kind of uh, error, but we kind of see this, and there's a, there are some implications to this. So uh, the two ways that this gets messed up is that you've got A and B are uh, are uh, appearing, and these announcements are supposed to stay within their between their cones, and so if B announces uh, leaks the routes, leak is the term for you're announcing routes in a way that you shouldn't be uh, to, a, to other, other entities that you shouldn't be. Um, if it announces the, leaks the routes out to its other peers or its providers, then it ends up being uh, inserted into the inbound traffic uh, to, uh, to A. And so uh, we'll give a, I'll give you an example of this uh, in the, um, after this. And then the, the alternative is that you uh, B is getting... getting uh, routes from its peers or from its providers, and it sends those on to A. And so then uh, B becomes uh, inserted into the traffic uh, heading out from A to those, to those routes. So scenario one, uh, B is inserted inadvertently into the inbound traffic, and scenario two, it's inserted into the outbound traffic. And so in uh, last year, there was a, uh, a, we wrote up, we got a little bit of press here on this one of, uh, uh, routing, routing errors between uh, China Telecom and Dimplecom. So out of, in Russia, there are three, they call them the big three, the three big, three big wireless carriers in Russia. So it's Megafon, MTS, and Dimplecom. And so maybe a couple of years ago, 
Biblecom announced uh, a network uh, sharing agreement with China Telecom, and that's actually pretty common. The Russian carriers typically have some Far East partner where they're trying to take advantage of trans-Siberian connectivity to reach the Far East, and each side sells it as a fast path either to the Far East or to Europe uh, uh, on each respective side. And so this is a pretty normal announcement. It makes a lot of sense. And when they were, but when they started bringing this connection up uh, last year, we, we were spotting that they were China Telecom was making errors almost every time that they were bringing it up. And the uh, uh, and both uh, sometimes it was one scenario or the other scenario. In this case, I grabbed one example where it was both scenarios at the same time. And so uh, China Telecom in this on this incident in August was inserted in a, uh, incorrectly into traffic both. Uh, uh, going inbound to Russia and outbound from Russia to the rest of the world. And, and then traffic was routed actually through China when it should have just stayed either in Europe or onto uh, the United States. So this is an example of a, a trace route mapping out the path of traffic from one of our servers in Moscow to uh, something back here in Manchester um, in uh, dear old Fairpoint uh, Communications. And this, where it normally would take a path through uh, just across Europe and across the Atlantic to get to Manchester, it, would, uh, it was getting redirected uh, the other direction, going through Shanghai and onto, uh, oops, uh, onto uh, across the Pacific and then across the United States back to Manchester. Yes? In terms of misdirection, what we did in Okay. He then called Tesla's uh, domain registrar, uh, and then since he had the one client verification oh, okay. and the phone number, he made uh, all, the all, the all the control of the website to his email. Oh, wow. So, and then took control of Tesla's <coughs> website. And a little earlier, sex.com uh, also got taken. I know it well now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Something as simple as this can occur in sure. terms of social engineering. Yep. What are the fails? I mean, we know that things like this can happen, but why are there not enough fail safes right now? Why could how how was a person able to just give his phone number and just take control of a company? All right, well you're describing social engineering uh, and uh, I'm just that's... trying to give give us a different uh, uh, angle. Yeah. I see what you're saying, but there's also this other side. So how do you You're right, there's other uh, there are, um, I, it's, it's, a broad, it's a broad topic for sure. Uh, you, you're mentioning social engineering. So the question was about uh, people who are social engineering, uh, people to uh, you redirect traffic. We actually, there's been a couple of high profile incidents where actually we were the, we actually benefited by being the new provider, the Dyn did of being uh, the new you know, trusted provider to uh, protect people's uh, domains. And, uh, and I, don't, I, I can't tell you what security protocol for the, what uh, Dyn does, but uh, I know it's pretty substantial because this is a, a known uh, threat vector. Um, uh, that is, uh, yeah, I think as long as we've got humans involved, uh, it's going to be hard to completely remove uh, some element of uh, um, social engineering. In this case, is there, uh, since this is a talk about routing and routing uh, anomalies, um, I'm kind of constraining this one just to the technical uh, routing uh, 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 impacts. So, but it's... My, you were, my question was about, like, all the, are you also considering things like this when we are considering these points of uh, security aspects? And that was what oh, okay. Uh, like of a DNS redirect? Yes. Um, yes. That's... Uh, um, let's see. I don't do analysis on uh, DNS for redirects. Um, <laughs> And uh, I know that uh, you know Dyn, a large company, is a DNS company that does the handle. Uh, I'm sure we've got experts that could speak to that. I, I'm not that guy, um, sure. but um, I know that we're for sure aware of it. But it's a yeah, it's an issue. All right, so um, this these are, this was back to the August 5th example where traffic was getting redirected uh, uh, through China to get to uh, Russia, and these were four different perspectives. So. Uh, these are uh, these graphs. Uh, I'll explain these. So the y time is uh, the x axis. The y axis is latency. This is milliseconds round trip latencies, and colored by what provider uh, traffic took to get to Vimplecom in this case uh, into Vimplecom in Russia. 
Yeah, from uh, Reston, Honolulu, San Jose, Guadal uh, Guadalajara, Mexico. It's a handful of examples on North America getting uh, redirected through China to get to uh, Russia. And clearly there is, an, uh, there is a performance hit. You know, we look at a lot of things from the performance stand standpoint, and there is a performance hit if your traffic gets dragged through the molasses of China because it has notoriously under-provisioned under um, uh, international links, and it's not going to be a good thing if you are uh, traversing China inadvertently, as these graphs would show. So, okay, how are we supposed to read these sure, graphs? the uh, x-axis is time, and the y-axis is uh, is latency. So, a higher latency is lower performance. Uh, a lower latency uh, is something faster. So, when you have these big humps, you see they change color, and the, at the same time that they change color, uh, they're also changing uh, uh, amplitude. So they're going, they're reaching higher, higher latencies, which are which is basically slower, uh, and they're also going through a different path. So they're going through a different provider because they're getting uh, redirected through China Telecom. But what about the things on either side? Of that? Uh, that is times when it's not uh, when that's normal on the on a, and then and then this period of uh, a few hours here is when this was active on this day. So it's kind of plodding along normally. It gives you a sense of what's what's the baseline, what's the normal. And all of a sudden, they turn on this bad routing, and you see it uh, jump up. It goes for it like that for a few hours, uh, high latency, going through uh, different providers, and then it drops back to normal when they turn it off. The latency is sort of a time thing, then, so it, go, it takes a longer time during that flip. Yeah, that's right. So during that during that during that time, then uh, and and partially that's that's uh, uh, due to a geographic, you know, the. Your, uh, the you know, the actual you know signals are traveling um, a larger geographic path, and uh, the um, and then some of it is just uh, congestion and provisioning uh, uh, issues with provisioning that China experiences. All right, so <clears throat> so the, the takeaway from that section is that you got routing mistakes that are commonplace, uh, and uh, and there is regular misdirection, even if it's uh, even if it's by accident or innocent mistakes. Uh, this is, uh, uh, like I said, on any any given day, I can find examples of this uh, type of uh, type of behavior. Um, and then I wrote a blog at the beginning of this year about kind of this vast world of fraudulent routing. These are is another class of issues where people are um, entities out there are announcing, typically announcing address space uh, that is unrouted that doesn't belong to them sometimes just for a very brief amount of time to do some nefarious behavior and then release that address space and move on to something else. So this behavior's been long associated with uh, spam. So people will do this to, uh, because they're, what they're trying to do is avoid, uh, either avoid blacklists. If they just use, if you do your bad stuff from a known IP address, then eventually you land on people's blacklists and they block all the traffic from that address space. So the, the next step is, well, I'll just keep moving what address space I'm using and, uh, and no one can kind of stop me from doing this. Um, like I said, it's 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 been known for spam, uh, but uh, there's uh, uh, some of the same entities have been involved in other types of uh, uh, bad behavior, and and it's kind of like the the uh, analog of uh, a criminal with a throwaway mobile phone can kind of do something bad, throw it away, and without some sort of uh, <clears throat> retrospective BGP analysis, it, if you had in a security log something bad happened to you from some IP address, this is typically how attribution works. Um, uh, you're going to see you know, Comcast, uh, you know, in New Jersey, based off this IP address, sent me some bad traffic, and uh, and so maybe I'll complain to them or block them or something. Uh, but it may not have been. Uh, if you you would have to know at that time how that address space was was routed, and that's not that's not unknowable. But the average uh, security analyst doesn't typically have that kind of those kind of tools uh, like like I do because that's all I do. So. Um, it is something I had a couple of security conferences I've spoken to, spoken, spoken at earlier this year. I've kind of laid that as a uh, uh, suggestion to the security analysts. Uh, uh, just proceed with caution with the attribution based off IP addresses because there is uh, room for, room for uh, um, uh, bogus behavior. And these are a couple of examples. So this is one that we've written about a couple of times about uh, out of St. Petersburg, Russia, where you have uh, routes. Again, these, these graphs along the bottom are just... Uh, Time uh, on the x-axis and y is, uh, in this case, this is a percentage of how much the internet, uh, you, you can interpret it as a percentage of how much the internet was believing these routes. And, and they are reaching, you know, in this one on the right, uh, they are reaching nearly 100%. So pretty much the whole uh, internet accepted these bogus routes. Um, and, what, and this entity uh, announces these routes. Uh, they kind of launder them through a couple of different, uh, uh, also fraudulent autonomous system numbers. So they're a little harder to trace. 
Um, and those get rotated out uh, regularly. The, the APHS ranges get rotated. And in fact, in the course of this talk, this thing is still active. And actually, in the course of this talk, it'll probably rotate a few more times uh, what address space it's announcing. And uh, so somebody's gone to great length to try to obscure uh, this. And if you were to go and look and figure out who, who it was who launched this thing at me from this IP address, if it's from one of these, it could be difficult to try to trace back where did this actually come from uh, without some uh, more comprehensive routing analysis. Uh, here was another example where we saw somebody, another entity out of Russia. We actually see most of the stuff out of Russia and Eastern Europe, so that seems to be uh, where they like to, like to do this type of behavior. But um, this was kind of a, 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 um, an improvement on the previous uh, activity where they were using, using autonomous system numbers of, of entities that were um, uh, fraudulently using these autonomous system numbers to announce address space belonging to those entities. So if you were doing a simple matching of what's the address space and the autonomous system number, it would look okay. And that's typically what a lot of AS reputations or security uh, tools that are trying to, try to get at this stuff. So they're trying to, de trying to uh, defeat or confuse those things by using a, a, a real autonomous system that actually, a system number that would be associated with the address space. And it would look plausible uh, when you saw it, except when it finally reaches the, the actual internet. And in this case, it was going, all going through this uh, small ISP in, uh, in Russia. Um, so <clears throat> again, with the, to the security analysts, the fraudulent routing, the IP address space attribution is, uh, it becomes more difficult. I wouldn't say it's impossible, but all right. So, uh, in summary of that section, um, oops. The uh, so, you know, we have a system that's vulnerable to manipulation. The errors and hijacking can do. We have examples of this actually happening. The fraudulent routing, the IP squatting, that kind of stuff, that's happening constantly, uh, and that's something to be aware of. It makes attribution difficult, and uh, and so you know, our pitch as a com company is that enterprise that ISPs ought to uh, uh, monitor their routes to try to um, keep, be a be abreast of this type of. Um, uh, behavior. So very quickly, um, I'll go through some of the geopolitical things. This is kind of another dis the other discrete area that we we, we weigh into, um, and uh, and so I'll give a couple examples of some highlights of things that we've gotten uh, some oops, some press for in the last uh, last year. So uh, the internet itself, uh, in nearly every country in the world, you have the, uh, the internet is is growing by any metric that you can uh, come up with. So. From our standpoint, we see a routing. How many players, like uh, how many ISPs, enterprises are routing traffic in a, in a country? Uh, every country in the world is growing up and to the right, no matter what, except in a couple of countries. And in any country where this isn't occurring, there is some pathology there uh, that uh, that's preventing that growth from occurring. So whether it's Syria, North Korea, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, uh, you can kind of easily understand what's going on there. That is not the normal state. The normal state is 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 uh, uh, you know, unrelenting growth, and um, and so we find you know this like there's always like a, a political geopolitical uh, conditions that affect the, the development, the growth, of the internet, and affect yeah affect uh, sometimes the actual connections itself. And so I'll give a couple examples of that. So in Cuba, uh, we broke a story a couple of years ago. We got a fair amount of press. Was uh, the activation of the Alba One submarine cable? So. Uh, up until just a couple of years ago, Cuba was only was reliant on satellite communications to access uh, the internet to the uh, rest of the world. Some of that was due to the uh, the embargo. Um, uh, up to, up until maybe 2009, when uh, the Obama administration created a telecommunications exclusion uh, and actually allowed a submarine cable to be built to Cuba, but nobody did it um, until and it was the Venezuelans. Hugo Chavez decided we will put up the money, we'll build the cable, connect the Cubans to the uh, uh, to the internet. It was it took a couple of years before it was uh, finally built. It was operational in 2011, and then uh, uh, once that was done, and Alcatel uh, submarine networks out of uh, France built the cable and left, uh, there was no, no, um, no word on what had happened to it. And the people who, people, there's, a, there's a cottage industry of people who are Cuba observers, I've, I've come to learn, uh, that uh, um, follow this, these kind of developments very closely. And there was no word from the government, there's no word from the state telecom. What happened to the cable, uh, it wasn't clear, and there was I got in touch with a, a blogger who was writing up something and saying, I, I heard some rumor that the cable maybe is active, uh, but does anybody know anything? And so I wrote to this guy and I said, here's a bunch of graphs. I can tell you for sure it's not up. And uh, I'll let you know when it's up because uh, it'll, um, uh, it'll, um, uh, I'll, I'll see it in our, in our data. And then he wrote that. He's like, I write that in a blog? And I was like, that's fine. Go ahead. And uh, you know, just, just credit us. That's fine. And then uh, he wrote that up and ended up being a, a headline in the Miami Herald. And I was like, wow, there's really an appetite for this story because uh, the quote was like, yeah, Doug Murray from Renesis at the time, 
uh, says there's no news on this uh, thing, and that was the story. And I was like, wow, I'm like, all right, well, I'll set something up. And so when this, when this thing occurs, you know, uh, when this ever comes active, I want to get notified. So I, call, I set a little trap in the data. And so like, about a year later, I got an email from that script that finally was like, hey, new connection in, in Cuba. And we noticed that the, uh, the cable had come active. And uh, so in this graph is, oops, this thing advances on its own. In this graph is uh, another uh, graph of similar to the ones previously. So you have ac the x-axis is time, the y-axis is uh, latency. And so these are measurements that we were doing from around the world uh, to uh, the infrastructure in Cuba. Uh, and this, is going, this has been going for years that we do these measurements. And we, see that we saw this new band of, of uh, measurements in green at A. And so that uh, is a, a latency. Uh, it went from, you know, in this case, from LA. Went from 600 milliseconds down to 400, and so traditional satellite can't go faster than 480 milliseconds, and that's due to just uh, the speed of light. Uh, just how do you get to outer space and back to get to a satellite and back? You just can't go faster in certain speed. Yes. Out of curiosity, is some of the satellites low orbit? Uh, that's a new trend where there's uh, right now there's there's medium Earth orbit uh, satellite. Uh, because the Intel sat, I think, is the faster one that implies it's lower. Uh, let's see. Actually, Intelsat's up at 600, um, the, the black. That's actually what goes away at A. Uh, and then it's Telefonica in green. That, um, now, later in the graph on the right-hand side, you have Tata, its satellite service, dropping down. And that's, that's an asymmetric thing, which I'll uh, explain in a second. So uh, you have a new band at 400 milliseconds, which is, if it's 400 milliseconds, there's no way this can be traditional satellite. It can't. Speed of light says you can't go bit faster. And you can't, can't break that law, right? And, uh, so I knew that this, this had to be it, and so we ended up writing a blog. We got a ton of press on this. Actually, the Cuban government came out and, uh, and confirmed our story uh, that it was uh, um, uh, that they had to activate, recently activated the submarine cable. And um, actually, as we wrote it up, I said, I, you know, like 400 milliseconds is still pretty high for a surface connection. I wouldn't. I wonder, I wonder if they made a mistake and the inbound traffic is coming off on the submarine cable, but it's still going out the uh, the satellite connection. And maybe they've got like a default route. They just send all their traffic outbound. Probably through their cheapest satellite, satellite provider to save on money. <clears throat> and they don't care, you know, where it's going to go uh, or which provider to use. And they just use the cheap guy. And so we speculated that there was an asymmetric uh, thing. And uh, and then then they seemed to fix that at sea late, a couple days later, where it got fixed and the asymm asymmetry went away. And um, what was fun is that a couple of uh, Months later, uh, May, I was in Medellin, Colombia at a conference, and uh, at a social event, the uh, organizers were walking me around, and they were uh, asking, who would you like to meet here? And I was like, well, there's a company, co couple of companies I need to talk to, but uh, I'd meet, talk to anybody from Cuba, because this story had just kind of come out, and I was like, I'd love to hear their take on this. And they were like, well, you're in luck. Right next to you is the, one of the directors of a text of the State Telecom of Cuba. Like, would you like to meet him? I was like, oh, sure. And so it was entirely in Spanish, too, which is my, I got rudimentary Spanish skills here. So we, I, was like, I was like, oh, my name's Doug Midori. I wrote this blog about your, your submarine cable. And, this guy's like this kind of big fat guy, with a grumpy, big mustache, and he's like, look, looks at my, looks down at my badge. He's like, yeah, I know who you are. And I was like, I was like, all right, like, well, well, congratulations. You know, I'm not really invested in the politics of this. Good for you for getting your connection up. I bet it's great. You know, and that's kind of where I was left. And then his next thing, I with completely entirely unprompted for me, and he's like. You were right about the asymmetric routing thing. And I, was like, I was like, oh, really? <laughs> it's like we went back and looked, and we were like, yeah, we, 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 we I was like, oh, that's fine. I mean, it was a new connection. You never had it up before. I'm sure, uh, you know, that's fine. But I was like, I was like, that's so cool to get some confirmation on that. But anyway, this is the uh, confirmation that came out a couple of days later from the uh, communist communist party news, and. Um, uh, yeah, so, and this is, Yanni Sanchez is kind of a, a probably the most noted uh, uh, dissident in, um, out, of, out of Cuba, you know, blogger who writes about it. And so she, she was our best friend for a week there. We're uh, putting our stuff out. All right, so very quickly, Crimea. So this is uh, uh, two quick examples here, and we'll, we'll wrap it up. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, last year we had the Russians take over Crimea. It's a, a area in circle uh, and uh, you know, was lore, formerly uh, uh, Ukraine, I guess it depends on who you ask. Um, <clears throat> so once the Russians took this area over, uh, the, uh, oops, the, uh, it, was a, it had an issue with infrastructure. All the infrastructure, and most of it still is, so this isn't completely resolved, is still dependent on mainland Ukraine, which was uh, a problem for the Russians. Uh, now, th these maps are maps of just the infrastructure for the gas, water, electricity, telecom, and uh, they all go to uh, mainland Ukraine, which was now considered foreign territory to the Russians who had just annexed Crimea. 
So uh, immediately after they had their vote, uh, if you remember, there was a vote to validate the annexation. Uh, they voted to stay with Russia, and Medvedev went there to give a speech about, uh, you know, welcome to Russia. Uh, and um, <clears throat> and in one part of this talk is it is unacceptable that uh, sensitive communications would leave Crimea and travel through a foreign country, referring to Ukraine, uh, because all the communications had to go across that land bridge back to Ukraine. And so I hereby order uh, Ross Telecom, which is a state telecom of Russia, to build immediately a submarine cable to, cross, uh, to go across the Kerch Strait, which is uh, about you know, six kilometers. It's not very far to get to mainland Russia, and we will connect up uh, Crimea to mainland Russia and they are still working on running the power this way and uh, everything else. But in fact, he felt so, uh, it was so emphatic that he tweeted it. Uh, this is his tweet. He's a big Twitter uh, user. Uh, maybe that is, should follow him. Um, and so he, and he got 287 retweets. So good for him on that. But uh, <laughs> essentially in Russian, it says, we got to build a submarine cable. It's unacceptable that uh, you know, Russian communications would go through a foreign, uh, you know, now it's an adversary, uh, Ukraine is to, to Russia. So that was one where I was like, all right, great. I will find when this com comes on and, uh, and uh, put this out. And so actually the following month, Ross Telecom claimed that they built the cable. It, they may, may have. Uh, it didn't come active until uh, 24 in July. And we saw a new path show up of uh, this a new entity showed up in Crimea that was uh, Miranda Media was the name of their local, the local Russian uh, branch or agent of the uh, Russian carrier <clears throat> and started signing up like gangbusters new new clients and they were dropping uh, Russian transit and moving over, uh, dro dropping Ukrainian transit and going over to the Russian and um, and so we uh, uh, kind of wrote that story we kind of tell it from a, um, a performance standpoint again because uh, some of this is has to do with um, uh, how what was the best thing for the for the for the Crimean portion of the internet and what's interesting is, uh, you know, as these carriers were getting uh, switching over to the Miranda Media Russian uh, service over the, the submarine cable across the Kerch Strait, they were making announcements to their users, uh, saying, you know, latencies to <clears throat> things in Russia are going to get better, and to everything else, it's probably going to get worse. Uh, but just be aware of that. And uh, and you know, in in their defense. Uh, there was a survey at the time saying that most uh, in the, the residents of Crimea relied on Russian Russian news and Russian content anyway, so maybe it was a it was you know better performance for the the, the people there. Regardless, it's a, it was an interesting development, and we saw tr uh, this graph on the bottom here is basically uh, from Kiev to a couple providers in Ukraine, showing how now they were taking a much longer path because the path from Kiev through Moscow down uh, down through Russia and back across this. Uh, a cable is a far lar lar longer geographic path than just straight across uh, Crimea. And so they were taking a performance hit just to be able to connect from uh, mainland Ukraine back to, uh, back to Crimea. Um, oops. All right, last one real quick. <clears throat> so North Korea, we, this ended up being like the biggest story we ever did. And we've, we've been in some big stories. We were in the, you know, we were uh, noted uh, uh, quite a bit in, when Egypt turned off their internet in J January 2011. We did a lot of, uh, we broke a big story. Like Cuba was a big story, I thought, uh, but this was the biggest ever. Uh, uh, this is December last, uh, this past year. So in November, setting the context, you had the so Sony was going to put out the, the dictator or whatever, the, the, mo the, the com comedy about killing the dict, was it the interview? Right, the interview. <laughs> um, I haven't seen it, but, um, uh, so that upset the North Koreans. They, ha they hacked uh, 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 Sony. Um, there's been, been lots of repercussions. Obama made a statement saying, "All right, we will on our you know on our terms, we will get back at uh, North Korea um, by our own means." And um, and then and then this then North Korea just went out. And um, and so I think uh, you know I think the consensus is that it wasn't the United States that did this. Uh, the United States was probably doing other things, but. Um, in the meantime, what we saw was, uh, I was kind of following a story with a guy who writes this, uh, this North Korea tech blog, and this guy, this blog is basically a, uh, a clearinghouse of open source information about um, uh, communications in and out of uh, North Korea. And so he's also a reporter, and so he and I have done a couple stories together, and then also, uh, we also talk about North Korea, and we kind of share, share insights. And so while this was going on, and we were kind of chatting, and I was like, hey, you know, like, it looks like, uh, it's like a Sunday night, I was like, like they're having a lot of, I can see a lot of routing and instability for North Korea. And it's like, well, let's check on it in the morning, see if it's something. And I came in in the morning, I was like, oh, they're down. And I was like, I made up a little graph. I sent it to him. And I went to a two hour meeting and I came back. And like my, uh, my email was, was blowing up. He had put out the story uh, about, you know, we were confirming that North Korea was down. And so I was like, all right, well, we'll if he's going to put it out, we'll put it out. And I put it out. We get a call from the New York, New York Times to confirm the story. It ended up being uh, big. And like the next eight hours, 
was nonstop talking to reporters calling in, and I was, uh, you know, ended up being, uh, I mean, from a technical standpoint, North Korea's internet, you got one AS, and four slash 24 routes, representing about a thousand unique IP addresses, represents the internet of North Korea. Uh, to uh, compare that, the U.S. is on the order of like a billion. So uh, the U.S. is like North Korea cubed. Um, and, uh, and so they are, they are incredibly small. And, uh, uh, you know, I remember sp speaking off the record with one of the reporters I know well, and they're like, you know, do you think the U.S. did this? And I was like, well, I don't know that. Uh, um, I, I really, I just know the routing. It went off. It had about 12 hours of duress. You can see it was routing and stability, and finally it just, just went kaput and was down. And... Um, uh, and I was like, but to be honest, as a taxpayer, I hope that if our government could do something like this, it better be really impressive, because this isn't impressive. This is like a, a pretty weak network that took a long time for someone to knock offline. But um, uh, anyway, I was, like, I was like, don't write that. Don't write that in your story, please. Uh, and, and she didn't, so I, that's good to have the relationships like that. So this is, uh, I, gave, I gave one of my graphs to the Reuters, and they reproduced it. We had, uh, like I said, we had this crazy, crazy media. Uh, and from a, again, from a, an analytical standpoint, from the stuff I do, it was a really thin story. We ended up being in, uh, like, it's four networks go down from a technical standpoint. That's the story. But it was just the context that it occurred in. And so then I, I, I got on NBC's Evening News with Brian Williams. Um, and, uh, and then I had to run down to Manchester to get into a studio so they could be, uh, film me to put me on uh, CBS Morning News the following morning. And then I was on Bloomberg and NPR. And um, yeah, like I said, we, we'd done a lot of big stories. This ended up being like the biggest thing uh, probably that we've ever uh, done as far as media attention. We had, I, had to, I know a fair amount of the media landscape in the United States to know, all right, well, if the New York Times calls, I'm going to call them. I answer that call ahead of, I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, a lesser, a lesser paper, you know, some, some trade rag perhaps, uh, and, um, uh, or, you know, NPR, TV, I'll, you know, you're going to answer ahead of somebody else. And so I'm trying to do triage. And then I started getting all these calls from foreign entities. And I was like, who is TTK? And I was like, well, that's like the BBC for Japan. And I was like, no, no, you should take that one. I was like, okay, fine. And so like, people are trying to help me understand who it is that's calling in. And we were on like the nightly news in, uh, in Japan and Brazil. And it was, uh, yeah, it ended up being a, a, a wild story. It's just kind of like a, yeah, like I said, a handful of things happened at the right time. Uh, we were just, uh, we put that very casually out and ended up being like the biggest story. So who knows? But, you know, so these, uh, the internet, it does not occur in a vacuum. It is, uh, it is, is subject to some of the same forces that the humans uh, 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 live in, in that uh, environment. And um, uh, we can kind of measure that from a, from a technical standpoint. There's a lot of great stories that you can tell from that. And that's it. So thanks for your time. <laughs> Question. Speaking of politics, oh, all right. is internet traffic stored, and if so, what percentage and oh. how, what do they put it all? Oh, uh, is internet traffic stored? I don't think, uh, I don't know. This claim, I guess I'd have to go to, like, Snowden disclosures to, to say, and actually some of those, I know that there was some discussion on some of the technical forums of some of the early disclosures of just, like, because there was some claims on some of these PowerPoint slides that kind of sounded like hubris for people who are expert, uh, saying that they had basically built like this network across the United States that could just warehouse all the traffic. And I was like, wait a minute. And then I think it, it was some cost in it as well that was like, I think we, we do this for a program that costs $40 million. And, and some of the uh, other like engineers at ISPs are like, wait a minute, you could do that for $40 million? We're not doing anything near these numbers. And it costs us like hundreds of millions of dollars to do the same thing. Like, how is this possible? You have to build another internet to do, to handle just the volume of traffic. So, uh, I feel like some of that stuff is a little bit hubris. I don't know. I, I don't have any way to uh, know other than just a, a, a sense of uh, operating uh, in the space. Yes. Uh, uh, local public library. Left yeah. <laughs> No, uh, Tor is operating on top of, uh, yeah, so it's an over-the-top kind of service. And uh, I guess for people who don't know, Tor, you know, some of you, you use this to access the internet, and then you're going, you're going to get routed uh, through some probabilistic system that will you don't know. Where you come out uh, is um, uh, you're not in control of it, and that's actually for your benefit because it's kind of anonymizing where you're coming from. So somebody who is receiving the traffic that you're sending doesn't know really, really where you're coming from, and there's, there's where you get the uh, anonymity. Um, I don't, we don't have a way to monitor uh, Tor. I, maybe, maybe there's some, 
I don't, I don't do anything with Tor. Uh, we did have, we have had uh, Tor, um, uh, like, uh, we call them activists or people who are, uh, I guess, uh, working with the Tor project in, let's say, countries that uh, that Tor is serving a, a very important digital freedom uh, thing, and we uh, they've asked questions about like, for this country, where would be the best next node to put? Because Tor is also latency sensitive, and so for some of these places where there's uh, repressive regimes, uh, there's issues with latency. Anyway, uh, some of it perhaps due to censorship uh, or, or um, uh, uh, let's say, great firewall kind of stuff. Um, and uh, and so the placement of the of the next Tor node is important because if it gets too far away and there's too high a latency, that the thing doesn't the thing doesn't work. Um, and I, I I'm not totally fluent on what are the outer bands of, of performance where it eventually starts to fail, but um, you know, we've, we fielded a few questions. We're like, well, uh, I don't know if you can get to these places, but these would be places where it would make, from a technical standpoint, latency where you would be, is a quick path out of this country. A tour node would probably do a lot of help, do a lot of good for the people in that country you're trying to help if you put it here. I don't know if you have to try to solve that on your own, but you can, can argue from a technical standpoint where, where you would put a node. That's about the extent of, uh, of Tor. I do I, I get questions about Tor uh, 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 quite a bit, and uh, I should I should probably invest some time. Maybe I can go over to the library and learn about it. I was there was a couple of days ago, and it was really great to hear two different librarians trying to explain Tor to two different retirees that were in the library in the middle of the day. I was returning some books, uh, and actually they were getting it generally right. I mean, without getting into the t technical details, and I was like I was like, wow, what a neat you know, like I was, I was you had to be proud of your library on that day. Yes. But I was told that the government shut that down. Well, they turned it back on. Yeah, they they had a vote. It was a it was a meeting. Uh, I mean, this is uh, this is this week, I think. Uh, so Tuesday night, they yeah they uh, the DHS and the law enforcement turned it uh, had asked them to turn it off. They turned it off, and they had a meeting whether to turn it on like Tuesday night. And on Wednesday, they decided it's going back on, and we will. Uh, and so that's pretty cool. And so that's right. Okay. And I've just been closely involved with this. Great. I work in the trust lab here. Okay. And we actually uh, wrote a letter to the Lebanon Library at the Board of the Trust Week saying uh, that Tor, uh, to not go back on uh, taking Tor away. And uh, they did not even have to vote on it. That just happened on Tuesday. So they met, but they did not even have to vote on it. They just never considered uh, de deactivating Tor. So they were, I think, just trying to manage the public perception and stuff like that. That's what they care about. And they put up uh, all the comments and uh, news articles in support of TOR uh, for public view, just so that the people would realize what TOR really is about. And out of, there were 100, out of 100 comments from the public, only two were against, and uh, a lot of people spoke for it. So not, nothing really um, was very radical. All right, thanks. So uh, let me interject here and ask you to say a few words about what your company does. So oh, sure. The work that you do, you sell that, right? Yeah, so uh, yeah, getting in the news doesn't pay the bills, right? So we have to sell a product. Um, and so what uh, we were acquired, we were, it was Renesis uh, before uh, April, May last year, and then we were acquired uh, by Dyn, so now we're Dyn. But, um, uh, so we'll go through both companies. So Renesis, uh, our main product is this uh, product used to be called Market Intelligence. Now it's called IPTI. And this is something we would uh, sell to telecoms around the world, and we would sell them service to help them understand different markets. And so do uh, algorithmic analysis and identify uh, who are their competitors and their competitors' customers, and just you know keep tra keep tabs on uh, how their competitors' customers are getting service. And that's super helpful for the uh, sales folks, uh, the telecoms that use this to ch keep track of um, you know, if they want to have. Uh, uh, do their sales planning and who they're going to go after. The other thing we would add in as little times we we could see when the activations came on, and we'd keep uh, um, uh, tabs on um, 
know, when the service started, because these contracts are typically written in 12-month increments, and so when you're coming up on the anniversary of a, a contract of a, of a uh, service activation, that's a great time for a salesperson to uh, go and uh, pitch their greatest sale, because uh, uh, they're, they're probably in negotiation right now to see if they want to re-up, and, uh, and so the sales guys use this to try to do uh, sales planning. I don't have any direct involvement other than just arming people with this information. We also have a lot of network engineers that do this that, that they'll, uh, from uh, large ISPs, and they want to look at different, they, look at, they typically look at themselves, number one, and they'll look at other carriers in these, in these products and make sure everything that they thought, how we classify things matches up with their understanding of the, of the network. And if there was any daylight between those two, then they typically get in touch and they were like, all right, why did you classify this relationship this way? Uh, and there's often routing uh, errors that we uh, can try to tr help them troubleshoot. Uh, and figure out it's actually not you; it's this other party. They're not announcing your routes the correct way, and they can get in touch and, and, uh, and fix that. So uh, that's the product that's uh, you know out of the top um, you know, 50 telecoms, something like 80 percent or something. We use, use that stuff, but you know, telecom spaces. There's only so many. This type of tool is useful if you're multinational. There's not that many. It's not an infinite space of multinational uh, uh, telecoms. Uh, so there's a, there's a, you know, we've got a, a base uh, thing. We do a lot of ad hoc projects where we've got people who contact us, hire us to do particular analysis. Um, and, uh, and we did work for the government of Bahrain for a while uh, to look at, uh, help their regulator understand how their policies were actually in changing the connectivity in the country uh, and trying to promote co uh, competition and uh, better, better connectivity. So we, we do a lot of random things. I, I, I'm one of the people who catches the random, random task uh, things. Um, and, uh, and so then we were acquired by, uh, by Dyn last year. And so Dyn is a DNS, uh, primarily known by its DNS uh, company. It's actually based in Manchester, just down the road here. And they uh, uh, make their money out of a, a handful of different DNS uh, services. They, the, na the name came from Dynamic DNS, but that's really a very small part of the company anymore. Uh, Dynamic DNS is, was a service uh, where uh, people would, if you have like your home computer and you're getting a different IP address every time you uh, you connect using your local uh, Comcast or service, and you want to be able to reach back into your computer, then you use this Dynamic DNS to use this uh, like a domain name that will always be updated with whatever IP address you got from your ISP, and that'll allow you to connect back. Real simple mechanism, and they just saw an opportunity out of a college you know dorm room uh, ended up being the foundation of the company. And then uh, now we do big things like we are the authoritative uh, DNS provider for Twitter. If you go to Twitter and your machine is doing twitter.com and translating that into an IP address for you to reach the Twitter servers, uh, that's Dyn, uh, that's, that's responsible for that, uh, that, uh, that translation. And so that very simple function, when scaled out to uh, the, uh, the total internet, uh, the, the, total, the, the entire globe is you know, a billion dollar industry of getting that right and, and there's also services you can add where you can kind of like I'll return a certain address under certain criteria. If you're in Vietnam, I'll give you a Vietnam address. If you're in this place, I'll give you something else. Um, and so that kind of stuff, uh, they, those are higher end services that they offer and, uh, and so they want to plug in better smarts to figure out how they can answer the, uh, do this high end services better and so we are uh, pretty good at understanding uh, the internet and, and a lot of places around the world, and so we're trying to plug in some of our technology into those services, and that's that's the value offering that we bring to uh, to Dyn. So that's we're we're doing it. We're in progress. How big was your team um, when your company first started, as opposed to when it got bought up? Uh, I think so. I started the company uh, 2009, and we were bought last year in you know, 2014. And uh, I think the whole time we were kind of hovered in the low 30s number of people. So it's a small group, and then uh, uh, you know, low overhead, we just had probably two-thirds were technical people, a handful of guys, uh, IT guys, uh, pretty high-end guys that, that were charged with um, storing like petabytes of data. I mean, we have colossal amounts of data that we, we store. And, um, uh, and then there's guys who write the software for the things that we sell, and then there's like myself and one of the founders that do analysis uh, and talk to the press. And so it was a pretty small team, and, uh, and it's very little overhead. We're kind of like, the, or very little turnover. We have the same, uh, yeah, no, little overhead as well. Uh, it's like the same guys when I got there, and they had all been there together with each other for a, for a long time when I got to the company in 2009, and we're still all the same, uh, you know, the same core of, of people. So it's a, it, it's a good place. Uh, it was a good place. It is a good place to work. And, um, and then Dyn is a much bigger operation where they bought us, and I think they were like, uh, so 300 and something people, and now maybe they're up to 400. They've got sales offices in uh, Sydney, Bristol, UK, and then they just opened one in Singapore last year. They went out and visited them. Um, so they, uh, it is uh, they're an expanding and uh, much larger, uh, larger company. Do you have any women in your group? 
Uh, yeah, in Hanover we have one uh, we have a, a female programmer, uh, um, and uh, let's see. Are you interested? Yeah. <laughs> and actually, when we when we acquired when we when we uh, got acquired, uh, Dyne had a couple of people that did kind of uh, R and D stuff because uh, we do some like the name research. I don't know if I totally love uh, the, the research in our name because I think that does kind of uh, make us sound like we were kind of like an academic uh, outfit, like kind of published papers, which we're, we're not, nothing against academics. But um, uh, yeah, we were kind of more operational analysis uh, is I think I would more characterize what we do. And, um, uh, and but they had a couple people that were similar that like did similar work and so they threw those guys over to us to be with us. So we had a couple dying people come actually join, come from dying to come work for us. And it was a man and a woman, and uh, and uh, very very sharp uh, woman. You never hired any women in your company. <laughs> uh, we hired the one that was in the office. She she works down the hall for me. She, so uh, Dine's offices locally are up at forty five line road. Yeah, we're uh, just up the street, so I didn't have to come very far to so, come to so the office. So Doug office. is a local person, and if people want to pursue anything, you brought up. Yeah, we have uh, uh, we have interns. Uh, if everybody's looking for an internship or something to, to work on, I'm in town here, and uh, yeah, interns typically work for me, and they do analysis work, uh, which I think is kind of like the, the pointy end of the spear for what we do. It's kind of like the really the cool stuff of uh, of uh, what um, you know Dime Research or Renesis uh, did. And uh, uh, and if you're interested, you know, come talk to me. We've got uh, we always have openings. We're pretty pretty casual about uh, dates and uh, the, the particulars, but um, uh, yeah, we've had a, we've had a pretty good success record. Three of the guys uh, that uh, have been interns have come to work full time uh, for us. A couple others have gone into graduate school that we uh, you know, wrote recommendations for them to, to go. And um, so we've had a, uh, it's been a good program. Well, let's thank Doug. All right, thank you.